The summit comes at a time when the U.S. and the Biden administration specifically is hoping to demonstrate its commitment to Africa at a time when Africa's geostrategic significance is on the rise and at a time when U.S. influence on the continent is on the decline. So I think in the next few days, I think we can expect a good degree of performance and theater. Um, uh, the U.S. will be attempting to demonstrate that it uh, respects African leaders as, Af as equal partners, that it respects the sovereignty of African states. We can expect to hear a lot of talk about shared goals um, on issues ranging from peace and security to democracy, development and climate change. And all in all, I think the U.S. is hoping to signal that it is doing something new and different here when it comes to U.S.-Africa policy, in the sense that it is taking African states seriously as geostrategic players in their own right. Now, when you look between the lines, you'll see that there are tensions that remain um, with, you know, tensions between this rhetoric and mainstream thinking in Washington, D.C. And I'm thinking here especially of Congress, which continues to be dominated by Cold War thinking that views Africa almost entirely through the lens of security and through the lens of geopolitical rivals. And here I'm thinking specifically of Russia and China. We can take the example of a bill that was passed in the House earlier this year, almost unanimously. This bill was called Countering Malign Russian Activities in Africa Act. And the title speaks for itself, right? The objective of this bill is to monitor and effectively police Africa in its relations with Russia, in terms of the kinds of agreements and partnerships that it might enter into. And um, some have interpreted this bill as an explicit response to and, and, in some ways, even a form of punishment of African states for the way in which they voted at the U.N. General Assembly earlier this year in the wake of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. You may recall that a good number of countries abstained in that vote. African states uh, represented about half of those countries that abstained, roughly 17 of them. And, uh, the U.S. was extremely frustrated by these developments and failed to take into account the extent to which African states were making this decision on their vote based on their own geopolitical interests. The U.N. Uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, went out of her way to talk down to those African states that abstained, to chastise them, to tell them that, you know, they don't seem to understand uh, the seriousness of what has unfolded. And we can see this kind of similar patronizing language evident in the text of the bill of this Countering Malign Russian Activities Act, in the sense that the U.S. presents itself as wanting to, quote unquote, shield African states from the, quote unquote, malign uh, activities of Russia. Now, at no point in the bill do they define what constitutes malign, but the U.S. positions itself as uh, morally superior and as well placed to, you know, um, lecture African states in their relationships with other powers. Now, we've also seen African leaders push back, right? A number of them have called out precisely this bill for the degree to which it is an insult to African sovereignty. And I think we can expect in the coming days that even as many African leaders play along with the rhetoric of shared goals and with the rhetoric of equal partnership, that behind the scenes they are deeply aware of the unequal power dynamics that continue to shape U.S.-Africa relations.